In part two, we will focus on exploring the relationship between mining and environmental health. Generally speaking, the environmental impacts of mineral extraction and smelting would be the release of heavy metals into the environment, air pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, water pollution in terms of lead, mercury and other chemicals, and as well in terms of waste, tailings, slag and acid drainage. I've put together a table that illustrates the different phases or processes of mining together with their environmental health hazards and the health consequences. For instance, in terms of extraction, mainly in terms of drilling, the health hazards will be the direct exposure to heavy metals, silica and asbestos, and sometimes as well arsenic. I remember when I was in field work, miners were saying that, you know, there is good silver in your mind when you start finding arsenic around. Obvious health consequences will be neurological deficits, eye and skin irritation, together with lung cancer, other lung diseases such as silicosis and digestion problems caused by the acids. On the contrast, during the smelting process, the health hazards are caused due to direct exposure to the mercury and other pollutants but as well due to the indirect exposure, which is through soil and water pollution. During the smelting process, the release of mercury and other pollutants can cause directly for the workers in kinds of manual processing of minerals. Problems of brain development, this is very important in terms of mining because of the large amount of child workers in mining companies and in the informal market as well. Kidney disease, various types of cancers, cardiovascular diseases, as well of, as skin irritation. When it comes to the indirect exposure, it is mainly because of the spillover effects. Health consequences of these environmental health hazards related to the smelting process will be food poisoning in terms of water pollution. There's Quite a lot of research done in Peru and Bolivia where fishes were found to have unhealthy levels of lead, for instance, and mercury. In terms of livestock and crops, and some of the health consequences will be kidney dysfunction, neurologic disorders, respiratory diseases, immunotoxicity, which involves autoimmune dysfunction in individuals living and working in the campsite and as well in the nearby communities. One research in 2010, we have the reference in here, indicates that more than 400 children died in Zamfara in Nigeria from acute lead poisoning. It was caused by unsafe mining and processing lead contaminating gold ore. The researchers found that people grinding the ore often took the job to their households. So the contamination, the environmental risks had consequences not only in terms of the direct mining camp, but as well around 180 villages in the area. At the global scale, actually, we find out that the global releases of lead from smelting and refining metals, such as gold, zinc and copper, total over 28,000 metric tons per year. Similarly, in the case of mercury, just for the specific case of artisanal mining, range from 400 to 1,100 metric tons a year. But this is not happening in low middle income countries when one would think that the regulations are a bit more lax or vague or maybe not applied. Another research conducted in 2008 and 9 found that the airborne emissions from metal mining and smelting in Australia, Canada and the States, which are countries with some of the world's best environmental control, total 980 metric tons of lead and 9 tons of metric tons of mercury, which is well beyond the allowance. This map in here, for instance, shows the mercury releases from artisanal miners in tons per year worldwide. One thing to take into account is, for instance, we can see that in Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Greenland, Morocco, for instance, it says that there is no estimate. That does not necessarily mean that there is no release of mercury. The problem as well is that little is known about the differences by productive sector in a similar way as we were discussing before about the relationship between development and mining. When we talk about the relationship between environmental pollution and mining, 
we still don't know enough as well as to, we need to take into account, as we said before, the different types of mining and the different technologies that go up associated to the different phases of mining. So what is being done about that? What are the environmental policies and interventions? Obviously, each country has national regulations and uh, there is the environmental code of practice for metal mines. For instance, those national regulations are guided by the guidelines of the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, for instance, has made available through its website a range of information on lead, including information for policy makers, technical guidance and advocacy materials. They are as well developing guidelines on the prevention and management of lead poisoning, which will provide policy makers, public health authorities and other health professionals with the evidence-based guidelines on the measures that they can take to protect the health of children and adults. As we know, the role of the World Health Organization is mainly technical advisory. And those guidelines are used by national governments to elaborate the regulations. But there are many barriers to compliance. For instance, a research from Oxfam America in 2002 researched the environmental compliance in the United States. The study focused on 183 large mines for which environmental impact statements were prepared since 1975. For a representative sample of those mines, the study compared the projections of water quality measurements once the mine was operating. The research found that for 84% of the mines, actual pollution violated the water quality standards the mines were required to meet. Of these falling mines, 44% had mischaracterized the geochemical characteristics of the ore. For instance, the sulfate content. 24% has mischaracterized the hydrology of the mining area, and 64% had been overly optimistic about the adequacy of the mitigation strategies. What this example shows, for instance, is something that has been observed in many large scale mining operations, faking compliance. And it brings about the issue of profit versus health, and as well the controversies around the short or long term benefit of mining. It is an economic benefit for few, or it is a public health development benefit for many, as we were discussing before. At a different scale, I would like to discuss as well the result of my own research in Bolivia with environmental audits. Influenced by the World Health Organization guidelines and, by, and with help from Danny, the Titanis Corporation, Comibol, which is the Bolivian Mining Corporation, decided to establish the need for environmental audits within cooperatives, which uh, cooperative mining in Bolivia represents some 96% of the mining workforce. That's where the debate between large scale and small scale becomes a bit controversial in terms of regulations. Together with Danida and the technical advice from local NGOs and the European Union, the government from Bolivia developed this um, environmental audit checklist that it was compulsory for cooperatives to be able to run and operate. According to the current legislation, compliance is compulsory. However, it is not enforced. So in contrast with the previous example, we were talking about faking compliance, we have now an example of hidden agreement for non-compliance. Miners know the government won't ask for that. The government does not ask for that. Meanwhile, they receive the economic and advisory support from international organizations to actually create infrastructures and the legislation according to the guidelines of the World Health Organization. As a result of this hidden agreement for non-compliance, we have that officially there are in Bolivia 1,642 mining cooperatives. The number of people working in each cooperative ranges from 10 to 10,000. Only 20% has the environmental audit, but an 80%, which makes around 1,313 cooperatives, remain active despite disregarding government environmental policies. And the government is fully aware. Those situations have often resulted in conflict. Conflict is in fact one of the main issues to be considered as well when considering the relationship between mining, health and development. 
a good source of information on conflict in Latin America and the Caribbean is OCMAIL, the Observatory of Mining Conflicts. According to this observatory, since 2010, only in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have had 210 conflicts associated with mining. 21 conflicts of those were associated with environmental impacts. And the root of those conflicts, that is the lack of popular consultation about where do we open new mines and what the impacts are on the population, the priority to mining as economic strategy that disregards the environmental impacts on local community, and the lack of redistribution of the benefits of mining. However, for the government, there is an important trade-off that we need to think about. It is profit and economic development versus environmental management. On the views of the government, it is as well employment creation as a poverty reduction strategy versus environmental regulation and an emphasis on the working conditions of people. We will discuss the issue of the working conditions, mining and occupational health in part three.